is uh, Professor Matthew Shadagas. I'm a assistant professor of physics at the University of Albany. And I'm going to be telling you tonight about dark matter. Uh, but before I launch into, into dark matter, I wanted to tell you um, and all about our invisible universe. I first wanted to start out with a little bit about Isaac Asimov, since tonight's talk is hopefully part of an ongoing effort to, um, aimed at, re at the sort of the resurrection of, of Isaac Asimov's famous uh, Institute on Man and Science here in Rensselaerville, discussing connections between uh, humanity and science. So a personal story uh, of mine that's kind of connected to Asimov, not directly, uh, but I was inspired to go into science by science fiction, and I always wanted to be uh, Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek Next Generation, even though he's an android, obviously I'm not. So I was, I was I'm too young for Spock, I caught up on the original Star Trek later, since um, <laughs> it was already off the air, not even in reruns, um, not even in reruns when I had, uh, when I had been, um, when I had been a child. So Data's positronic brain was inspired actually as an homage to Isaac Asimov's robot artificial intelligence uh, series. So here are some of my favorite um, books. Actually, there's the Isaac Asimov's robot series, Caves of Steel. That's a great book from 1954 and it still it reads very fresh. And then a childhood favorite of mine on the left, the Unidentified Flying Objects. Um, from, it's not a, a by Isaac Asimov, it's Isaac Asimov's library. Um, of the universe, talking about the, the possibilities of extraterrestrial life and travel. So these were very um, formative and inspirational uh, uh, for, for me that, uh, uh, so I was really inspired by writings like this uh, from a young age in order to later then uh, go on to become a scientist. So now the story of dark matter, this uh, uh, cutting edge, uh, scientific inquiry. But the, the, I want to begin the story of dark matter. Let me see, I can move out now. Oh, yeah, I've got my clicker. Okay, so this, the historical perspective starts with these two individuals. There's Fritz Wicke and there's uh, Vera Rubin. So uh, there, there's, uh, there are some who say that so Zwicky was first or that, that Vera Rubin was first in terms of oh, who gets the most credit for the similar work in dark matter. Um, so Fritz Wicke, in the 1920s, looked at galaxies, a cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster, and found that their, the velocities of these galaxies were so large that the cluster should break apart. Um, it should not be gravitationally bound. Uh, that was ignored, though, for many decades, and he had very uh, large uncertainties in his analysis. But then in the 1970s, we have the work of, 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 of Professor Vera Rubin. And Rubin's work was really, um, was really uh, transformational. Um, and she, unlike Azwicki, looked not at galaxies, but at stars within galaxies, and found that stars within galaxies were revolving around centers of galaxies, the centers of galaxies, faster than they should. And so um, both of their, uh, their work pointed towards there being additional matter, additional mass generating a gravitational field beyond the matter we see visible uh, in, in stars inside of galaxies. So this is a great example of, of Professor Rubin's very important work where she discovered that if you look at any galaxy, Instead of the speeds of rotation of things going around centers of galaxies, instead of going down, instead, speeds seem to be going up, flattening, or they keep increasing. And this is not what we expected. If we look at our own solar system, planets or objects like Neptune and Pluto are, of course, orbiting much more slowly, have a longer uh, <coughs> year than things closer in, like Mercury and Venus, and then the, the inner planets. And so we expect the same behavior on large galactic scales, and we don't observe it. So this is not exactly the same behavior since here, moving further away from the sun here, we're talking about a galaxy that's an extended mass. And so there's first an increase here you do expect until you're past most of the mass here in distance. But eventually we will expect it to start seeing a drop off, just like we do gravitationally on smaller scales in our own solar system. 
Now, we can explain pictures like this by postulating the existence of additional matter. And in a galaxy like our own, so here's a, di a, a cartoon diagram of the Milky Way. Here's the sun 26,000 light years away from the center. There's the galactic center where the supermassive uh, black hole is in the center of our galaxy, as in the center of most or all galaxies. This is a central bulge of, of, of stars orbiting the central black hole. And this is, this is the, the plane of the galactic disk, which is over 100,000 light years across this way, but it's very thin this way. But we have these red dots here. These are globular clusters. They're, they're dense clusters of stars that are outside of the plane of the galaxy but still seem to be trapped gravitationally and are orbiting. And we can't seem to explain this without adding, without postulating extra invisible mass in sort of a spherical or elliptical halo of dark matter represented by this gray haze here. That's additional matter. And another way of, so this is a cartoon, but another way of looking at this with real data is, so this is, this is these are images from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We can, and this is galaxy NGC 0507. So these fuzzy patches here are not stars. These are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each, just to give you um, the scale here. And so this is a galaxy with other satellite galaxies around it. This is the visible light. But if we look with x-rays, we see that we have x-ray emitting gases that are in the interstellar or intergalactic medium here. And there doesn't seem to be anything gravitationally binding them into, the, into this cluster of galaxies here. But yet there's gas all around. So speaking of gravity, though, another way we can look at this is through an effect called gravitational lensing. So a strong enough gravitational force actually bends light. And the amount of bending allows you to calculate, allows you to calculate the um, amount of mass or the amount of matter that's doing the bending. So you can, what you're looking at here is actually these, these little curvy things here are not different galaxies, but you're looking at the same galaxy whose image is being repeated and distorted. So gravity can act like a lens, just like eyeglasses or contact lenses. You can bend light. Um, it's a different, different principle than you have in optics. As I said, as I said it's, you have a warping of space-time from gravity that, allow, that distorts light. But that distortion of light allows you to calculate how much matter is doing the distortion. And what we find from this is that this agrees with the galactic rotation study you just saw. There's more matter than is visible in the stars and galaxies here. So the next uh, piece of evidence that there's extra invisible mass in the universe that we don't see, this is a bullet called the bullet cluster. This is actually a collision between two galaxy clusters over a billion light years away. And what you're looking at here is, an imp is, is our three images imposed, superimposed on each other. You have the visible light image, you have gravita the gravitational lensing map in blue, <coughs> and then you have the X-ray emitting gases in pink. And this is just another way of looking at it, the contours here representing the, the, gra the, the, the gravitational distortion calculated on this image in blue. And what we find is that we have two clusters of galaxies colliding and gas from the collision mixing in the center, but there's the, the centers of mass, as defined by the gravitational lensing studies in blue, do not match the centers of mass in the pink here or in the visible optical center of mass. So again, most of these spots, well, some of these are stars like here, but most of the splotches of light in this image is we're looking at galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. So these are two clusters of galaxies that are merg colliding and merging. And the only way we've been able to mathematically and robustly explain this image is that we have matter that's not visible, not shining in the stars inside these galaxies, that kind of slips out of the collision point and forms these two lobes on the side. So up until 
the bullet cluster, and even through the, the bullet cluster discovery around 2006, I believe it was, there's still another option, uh, which is that our understanding of gravity is wrong. There is no extra matter. We can modify our law, the law, the law of gravity. So here's a joke from XKCD, from the law Randall Patrick Monroe, <laughs> former master of physics model. Yes, everybody has already had the idea. Maybe there is no dark matter. Gravity just works differently on large scales. It sounds good, but it doesn't really fit the data. So there are many, like theoretical physicist Eric Berlin. So this is not a crackpot idea. It's a very serious idea that dark matter is not real and that we don't need to postulate additional matter. We just don't understand gravity. Now, the issue with this is, is we think we understand gravity very well. We have recently uh, had the Nobel Prize winning discovery of gravitational waves, which was yet another confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So we think we understand gravity fairly well, not just on the scales of our solar system, but beyond it. And so while it's still possible to come up with modified theories of gravity that explain some of the data, maybe even more than half, you don't, it's very hard to come up with an idea that, of modified gravity that fits all of the data. So the more data we collect, the more evidence we find that there is more uh, to the universe than what we can see. So beyond just the rotation curves and gravitational lensing, we also have something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this is a microwave scale radiation that comes from all parts of the sky and is sort of, you can think of as a le the leftover um, a radiation from the Big Bang. So when this was discovered in the 1960s, it, it really um, made the Big Bang theory take off against the, uh, the opposing model, which was called steady state, that the universe uh, is eternal. It doesn't have a beginning. This, this, uh, the discovery of the CMB, as it's called, um, is, is pretty strong evidence that the universe does have a beginning. And the CMB, by studying the very small, very, very small, very much smaller than 1% temperature fluctuations in the, in the CMB. That's what these orange and blue here pixels represent hot and cold spots where, where, where basically outer space itself has very slightly different temperatures. We can match these slight variations to computer models and these very, these very, very slight variations tell us Many things tell us the age, age of the universe, the shape of the universe, the size of the universe. It's all the very, very, um, you know, an entire talk can be devoted to the CMB. It's its own large, intense field of research, but it's not my field of research. So why am I bringing up the CMB? Is that if we, if we mathematically analyze the fluctuations in the CMB, it allows us to, to, to come up with this pie chart. Because different forms of matter or energy will affect the CMB in different ways. And so this pie chart is known as the, the standard cosmological model or the, or the lambda CDM or cold dark matter model. And so the, this pie chart shows the multiple components that compose our universe uh, today as the, as the fractions um, do can evolve with time. So what we have in this pie chart, 69% is this, this thing here called dark energy. There's absolutely nothing to do with dark matter. Well, it could be, you know, most likely not, except for sharing the, the term dark, because we don't know what the heck it is. So dark energy is something we don't understand that's causing the expansion of the universe to go faster. So it's not causing the expansion of the universe original, uh, originating from the Big Bang, but it's accelerating. It's increasing the rate of expansion of the universe. We don't know what it is. It does seem to have sort of a kind of an anti- gravitational-like effect is pushing things apart. And so we know even less about this than my topic tonight, dark matter. So dark matter, according to the CMB and all the other studies I've shown you so far, seems to make up about a quarter, 25% of the universe. And then this five, here we have atomic matter of 5%. Now you might think, oh, you know, we're only made up you know, the stuff that makes us up in this room and make up our bodies is only 5% of the universe. No, actually, it's a much worse than that. <laughs> so of this 
75% is hydrogen. Oh, and 25% is uh, <coughs> so, so again, 75% is hydrogen, 25% of that chunk is helium. So that rounds to 100%. So most of the atomic matter, ordinary matter in the universe, is either hydrogen or helium. Everything else, oxygen, silicon, carbon, phosphorus, all these elements in the periodic table and elements of life, we are the sub, sub 1% dregs of the universe, the, the smallest quantities. Too small to appear in a chart like this. There are other things we can put, uh, neutrinos, photons, black holes, I'm always asked, are black holes dark matter? Well, there don't seem to be enough of them. Um, the, of course, this, this could be wrong, and we keep going back and forth and back and forth over the years about wait a second, what if, you know, but we just, the current consensus is that there's not enough black holes to make up the 25% dark matter. So, I'm always thinking, given how small ordinary, ordinary matter we think we understand is, I always wonder are there aliens out there made of dark matter, and there's, the, there's a brilliant dark matter alien scientist who goes to his government and says, I need money to look for the missing 5% of the universe. And they're like, you're crazy, 5%, that's not real. This is an error, there's no atomic matter. And the scientist says, no, I've got it. I know what the missing matter is. I'm gonna call it the proton. And you know, we laugh, right, because there's neutrons, electrons, everything else, but if 75% of this is protons, actually, um, that individual would not be far off from the truth because the vast majority of atomic matter is just protons. This is just a, a hydrogen gas. So this is the, the state of affairs, and this pie chart we've managed to cross-check multiple different ways with different astronomical studies, and we always come to the same answer. And our earlier studies going back 50 years or more even um, concur with this. So before we knew about dark energy, you'll hear, you'll see numbers quoted like 85 or 90% of the universe is dark matter. And that's because 25% divided by 25 plus 5 is about 85 to 90%. So before we learn about dark energy, we, you, you'll see quotes from older studies or articles from the 1980s and 90s, and they're not contradictory. It's actually consistent <coughs> because this chunk was missing. And so all our previous work, like the gravitational lensing and galactic rotation curves, agree with this uh, study, with this picture we get from the, from the CMB. So now, let's look at the large-scale structure of that atomic matter, of visible matter in the universe, and what we find is that it clumps, and the galaxies tend to cluster in little pockets. And the only the way we've been able to explain this, and we can now, fairly well with computer simulations is that we have here, what happens over time as the universe evolves, is that dark matter clumps gravitationally. And ordinary matter in the form mostly of hydrogen and helium gas is attracted to the dark matter clumps. And then what do we get? We get the structure of galaxies and galaxy clusters um, that we have, that we observe out in the uh, out in the universe, and I, I whenever I look at so these is so these are computer simulations. But this is real data. So when we look out in space and we we mapped you know billions upon billions of ga galaxies, we see what is called the cosmic web. So dark matter causes matter to clump, whereas dark energy in the expanding universe pushes things apart, and so we have clumps. Separate clumps of galaxies, of clusters of galaxies, and clusters of ion clusters, superclusters, but then we also have these great voids with very little matter in them. Whenever I see images like this, though, I can't help but notice it seems a lot like neurons in a human brain or any or or, or other or mammalian brains or almost any brain, um, any brains for, or any vertebrate brain for that matter. So it, this could just be a grand coincidence or you know, just a great cosmic joke. But if you do look at the structure of the universe, it does look like um, a giant brain. But I told you about all this astronomical evidence we have for additional matter, but what is it? What is that stuff? So we have a couple different ideas. We have many, much more than a couple different ideas. I don't have time to go into all of them. But on the next slide, I'll give you two great examples. So one idea, is called supersymmetry. 
So this is the idea that for every particle that has one type of spin, there's another called a superpartner or a sparticle that has a different kind of spin. And these partners, represented in this cartoon with larger radius circles, this doesn't represent physical size, it's saying that the superpartners have more mass. And the lightest of these new particles might have the right properties to explain dark matter. So this is not a dark matter theory. Um, supersymmetry of theory is, is just stands on its own as, as something in particle physics. It's convenient though. You could kill two birds with one stone. If supersymmetry is real, that's already, that's nice on its own. But it might also, as a secondary effect, if supersymmetry is discovered, we may have a good candidate, one of these heavy, heavier new particles could be dark matter. Now, this is kind of analogous. It's not a perfect analogy, but this is kind of like matter and antimatter. So, the big difference between supersymmetry and antimatter is that antimatter is real. I mean, we've been using it since it was discovered in the 1930s. So, um, you, can, you, can't, you can't make enough of it, though, to make a weapon like in um, Dan Brown's Angels and Demons. It's crazy because, you know, we make you know, individual particles of it, um, very small amounts. But antimatter is a similar idea except with electric charge. So for every particle, there's an antiparticle that has equal but opposite electric charge. This is something similar, but with spin. It doesn't mean opposite spin. It's a little more complicated than that. But this is, again, a similar idea in the sense of symmetry, that we see certain types of particles with certain numbers, with certain values, and we postulate what if there are others that have uh, the, a, a complementary, different value. So there are sort of these mirror particles then that maybe could explain dark matter. This is a very popular notion. There's another one, maybe not as popular, and this is the idea that there are extra dimensions. So what I mean by that is imagine if, so there's another direction to move other than left, right, up, down, in out, the F3, X, with the X, Y, Z coordinates we know and love. Imagine there's a fourth direction move we can't perceive. <laughs> and I don't mean time. So if we're counting time as the fourth dimension, then this would be a fifth or, or higher one. The problem is there's not, no analogy. There's nothing I can do to explain it. You know, if we all lived on this carpet, let's say we all lived in Flatland, there would be no way to explain to the residents of Flatland what up and down means. There was just no vocabulary for it. So similarly, what if there's another direction we can't perceive? But now, let's take that a little bit further because we need to explain why we can't, why don't we perceive that direction? And it could be that it's very small and curled up. It's not just linearly infinite like there are three coordinates directions we have now. So let me explain what I mean by that. Imagine you're looking at a garden hose from very far away. You might think it's one dimensional, it's just a line. But if you look closer, you see the line has thickness, it's two dimensional. But if you look even closer, you see, ah, no, it, it's a two dimensional surface wrapped in the third dimension, and it's actually a cylinder, it's a cylindrical surface. So it's a plane that's been wrapped up. So similarly, it could be that we don't perceive extra dimensions because they're very small and they're curled up or curved in some way on very small length scales, subatomic scales. But if we have this sort of cylindrical geometry to our additional dimensions, this would have a, a consequence in particle physics that we get extra particles. I mean, th that's called the Kaluza-Klein Tower. And the Kaluza-Klein Tower, just like supersymmetry, gets you extra particles. So maybe one of those particles, maybe the lightest one, if it's stable, if it doesn't decay, maybe that explains dark matter. We, have, we, we get a natural extra particle. These are just two examples, though, out of dozens. So here's a great cartoon, again, from XKCD, showing dark matter candidates at a very great range of masses. And um, about half of these are real, but there's a lot of jokes hiding in here. I love um, electrons painted with space camouflage, um, no slums, eight balls, um, obelisks, monoliths, pyramids, space cows. I love this um, black holes ruled out by buzzkill astronomers. Astronomers always ruling things out. So, 
Um, and here's another great one. Maybe those orbit lines in space diagrams are real and very heavy. You know, those dashed lines to like the orbit of the Earth. So, but some of the crazy ones, cue balls, that's a real thing. Sterile neutrinos, that's also real. A lot of these with crazy names are actual real uh, models or hypotheses. But there's a very broad range here. Dark matter could be the size of a supermassive black hole or so small that it has nearly zero mass. It could be anywhere in between. We don't know because we don't know what it is. And so there's no shortage of ideas. I've just given you on the last slide here, Oh, so in this slide, two very broad possibilities, uh, categories. Both of these, though, kind of lead to the same thing. They lead to um, a, a, a particle that's uh, a few, could be a few tens or a few hundred times heavier than a proton. But going back to the idea of extra dimensions, there's another idea. This is called the Randall Sundra model, that dark matter is just ordinary matter, but it's hiding in a direction we can't see. It's in another dimension, an extra dimension. Now, I should be clear. I don't mean, I don't mean dimension the way it's used in science fiction. It doesn't mean like a parallel universe. It's our universe still. It's just another direction uh, to move that we are capable of, per, of, uh, of perceiving. Now, what's really elegant about this approach is that it's, you don't need any new particles. Oh, dark matter, it's just ordinary matter. But it's just in another, it's on another plane of existence in a sense. It's, on a, it's in a, another direction. So if we imagine our universe as a flat surface, using a flat land analogy again, dark matter is you know, up or down, it's a direction we do not perceive. What's nice about this is it, it, it gives a natural explanation for why gravity is so weak. So you might wonder, gravity is weak, but is it really hard to like leave the Earth's surface? Well, the Earth is really big, and the sun and things like that. It's kind of a, a bit of a mystery in physics that why is it I can take a refrigerator magnet and a paperclip? That refrigerator magnet wins. It beats the entire planet Earth. Why? Why is electromagnetism so strong? So this, the Randall syndrome model explains that by saying, ah, gravity appears to be very weak in our dimension because it's leaky. Gravity leaks across all dimensions. It's a nice idea, however, if this is true, then I'm wasting my time. My experiments are just trying to find dark matter here in our dimension as a new particle. So if dark matter is here in our plane of existence, what could it be? So we went through all these ideas with supersymmetry. Um, supersymmetry and, and, and models like that give us something called a WIMP. That's an acronym that stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. And here's a nice plush toy you can buy for your kids from the particle zoo, particlezoo.net, and this one's dark matter. I know, I, I know that the plush toys, they have different, they're different masses to, for the, the representing the mass of the particle they are. But since we don't know what the mass of one dark matter particle is, I don't know how massive they need it. So. Um, also, I hope they use the logarithmic scale because there are particles that differ by many millions. So, but this is the plush <laughs> dark matter toy. So, dark matter may still, may not be a new fundamental particle. I bet, I would bet that a substantial fraction of you, right now, are thinking, why can't dark matter just be ordinary matter that happens to be dark? And that's an excellent question. So, one idea we, we have is that dark matter actually made something called machos. And you can see we love our little jokes in physics, right? Macho versus wind. So macho stands for massive compact cable object. This is the idea that dark matter is made up of a, a lot of ordinary matter in dark configurations. For instance, um, uh, rogue planets that have been ejected from their star systems, and so they're dark, they're, there's no star, they don't have a primary star, a sun that's, that, that light is bouncing off of them anymore. <coughs> Or they're dead, dead stars, or brown dwarfs, as they're called, like this artist's illustration here. That looks, you may, this may look a lot like Jupiter to you. So the idea here is you have Jupiter-sized, or larger, much, or even 10 or 100 times larger than Jupiter-sized objects. And these objects don't shine, um, unless they're reflecting you know, light of, of, of a star. They don't shine because they weren't large enough to become stars and ignite nuclear fusion. So you might think, what if galaxies are populated with a bunch of these brown dwarfs, rogue planets, dead planets, um, dead stars, black holes? This doesn't work, though. Because first, 
We don't seem to have enough of them when we look for this and extrapolate from small studies to then extrapolate and estimate how much we have in entire galaxies. But there's another reason, which is that ordinary matter interacts many different ways, not just gravitationally, electromagnetically, all these different things. And our studies like that of the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, tell us that whatever dark matter is, it interacts primarily through gravity. So that kind of rules out almost um, a lot of our standard model particles. And so that's why, so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on this cute guy here on the left. So let's imagine that dark matter is made up of some sort of heavy fundamental particle that's not like quarks or protons that make up you and me that have some different properties, including uh, being heavier. And I should stress that we have weakly interacting massive particle that after is generic. So that could be supersymmetry, could be collusive Klein, extra dimensions. It's just an umbrella term for sort of a vanilla generic dark matter candidate. So if these particles are around though, as the, as we uh, rotate as we rotate and as we revolve around the sun, and as the sun revolves around the center of the galaxy, we should be able to see a variation in the signal that we get. Um, you know, if we try to detect this dark matter, and this is called the wind wind, is if there is uh, if there's dark matter dark there are dark matter particles that are at rest in the frame of reference of the galaxy, and the sun is racing through the galaxy or around the center of the galaxy, then we should see variation in the amount of wimps we get over the course of a day or over the course of a year. But so, so you can look for this da daily or annual modulation, but that does not tell you yet. I haven't told you, well, but what kind of technology can we use if, if dark matter is a particle, say it's a wind, it's a new kind of particle we haven't seen before. How do we find it? How do we discover it? And so there are three main detection strategies. One is called direct production. This is where you bang standard model particles together like protons at the Large Hadron Collider at Switzerland in Europe. And you try to make new particles. Another approach is called indirect observation. This is where you wait for dark matter to interact with itself. You have to assume it interacts in some way other than gravitational. And then you can bang dark matter together so reading the diagram this way, you can bang dark matter together, something happens that we don't understand, and we, and we produce things like gamma rays or neutrinos, particles that we already know and love and can detect. So that's indirect observation that's usually done with satellites, with spacecraft. Um, there's also uh, experiments at South Pole at Ice Cube. And then so we have direct production, we have indirect observation, but there's a third method called direct detection. And that is the focus of my work, of my research. And with direct detection, what you have is dark matter bumping into a standard model particle. So it's like